patients to the right place fast enough. They're also worried about the patient that requires two separate services if those services are separated at two different hospitals. Now, before the separation, doctors warned the hospital this would, might not work. They warned the hospital that patients could be caught in the middle. And now that warning appears to be coming true. No one expected Debbie DeVoe to die. At her funeral in late October, friends and family were numb, stunned by the sudden death of this bright, lively young woman. Debbie DeVoe was 26, recently married, building a life with her young husband in Pickering. Many of her friends didn't even know she was sick. First it was a cold, then a rare virus attacking her blood and her heart. Just days before her funeral, her family thought she was recovering, Open heart surgery a success at one of Toronto's most famous hospitals. Debbie DeVoe was here at the Toronto General Hospital in the cardiovascular intensive care unit under constant scrutiny by doctors and nurses. At 7 a.m. on October 26th, one of those nurses noticed Debbie had a critical neurological problem. But there are no neurosurgeons here anymore. Ever since the merger, they're all two and a half kilometers away at the Toronto Western site. Debbie DeVoe lay here for three hours, an aneurysm ravaging her brain, while doctors and nurses tried desperately first to reach neurology at the Western, then to get a CAT scan, and finally to get Debbie over to the Western to a neurosurgeon. When Debbie arrived here at the doors of the Western at 10.15 that morning, it was too late to operate. Doctors will never know if Debbie's outcome would have been any different before the merger. But doctors and nurses say they are worried about future patients who get caught in the same gap. Today, Debbie's husband, Rene, and her sister-in-law, Rennie, wonder if she could have been saved. What did they say after it was all over? Well, at the Chang Hall, didn't they say, well, just transferring her in Western, they just, um, they said, well, better get a family in. <sighs> <laughs> Rene can barely talk about that morning. His sister-in-law is equally distressed. When, when the doctors I've talked to talk about this case, they say, in retrospect, given the severity of the aneurysm, it was probably too late right from the beginning. Now, you know now that it took three hours for her to be moved to, to where a neurosurgeon could see her. Mm -hmm. Does that make a difference to you when they say, well, it probably wouldn't have made any difference? Probably is not good enough. Like, I'd like to know right there and then, is she, is she going to be saved? Like, is there a chance? Don't say probably. Like, if there's probably, do it there. Don't transport her across town and take the chance with a time factor involved. Doctors here are afraid to talk on camera about Debbie DeVoe and about the merger. They're worried about their jobs. But privately, many told me three hours is too long to wait to see a neurosurgeon at a major teaching hospital in downtown Toronto. Before the merger, when the neurosurgeons were in the same building, a specialist would have been at Debbie's side within minutes, a decision whether to operate or not made within a fraction of the time. Doctors at other hospitals say the same thing. From your experience, is three hours too long? Far too long certainly by a factor of 10. I mean, it's, uh, that's entirely unreasonable from what you described. Dr. Michael Schwartz is a neurosurgeon and a trauma expert at Sunnybrook Medical Center. He believes the Toronto Hospital has created a dangerous situation. If you come to the general and uh, you've got a, a busted head, you've got a blood clot expanding inside, and well, you'll die long before you see a neurosurgeon. That, that's really suboptimal care for, you know, for a major, major teaching hospital in, in a big city. Toronto General and Toronto Western merged to become one mammoth institution four years ago. But it wasn't until six months ago the administration began splitting up services. Cardiology, chest surgery, microvascular surgery, obstetrics and gynecology at the Toronto General site. Neurosurgery, orthopedics and trauma at the Toronto Western site. It happened in spite of objections from doctors. They warned hospital officials that patients could get caught in the middle. But the administration went ahead. And today, doctors, patients, x-rays and records are shuttled back and forth between the two sites. The shuttle bus leaves every 15 minutes during the day. At nights and on holidays, it doesn't run at all. If the doctors have to move quickly between the two sites, they're on their own. 
patients who have to move can end up waiting hours. Did you have to wait long to get her moved? <laughs> yes. How long have you been waiting? Uh, she's she's 90 and she broke her hip and uh, she uh, since from uh, I think she came in about eight o'clock and uh, so she's just being moved now over to Western because they've got no orthopedic uh, section here now. Marion Strebig and her mother were at the wrong hospital. They spent six hours in the Toronto General Emergency Room before an ambulance arrived to transport them to the Western site, the only place you can go for a broken hip. The hospital doesn't have an ambulance standing by. So patients like Isabel Taylor have to wait until Metro Ambulance drivers can get there. Drivers say they have to handle more urgent cases across the city first. What's it put somebody through like her to, to sit there for six hours with a broken hip? I know, I feel bad. I, it, I feel badly that it definitely is a problem there. Let's be honest, the moment you begin to move patients outside of a hospital environment, you are taking a risk. I don't care who it is you move or what it is you move. Dr. Murray Girardi knows what he's talking about. He left Toronto Hospital in February to become Chief of Surgery at London's Victoria Hospital. Because of a series of circumstances, this hospital is separated on two sites as well. In the early 80s, the province started constructing one building to house the entire hospital. They ran out of money halfway through. Now, doctors, nurses, and patients routinely shuttle back and forth between the two sites, about as far apart as the Toronto General and the Toronto Western. Girardi says splitting services is a nightmare. But the potential is there that people Absolutely. could die. Absolutely, yep. So then why go ahead and create a situation where you couldn't, people could die? <laughs> I don't have the answer for that, I'm sorry. I, I think Girardi that, uh, says his uh, hospital is trying to get together on one site. We're doing this out of absolute necessity. We're working this way because we're forced into it. They're doing it because they want to, and I don't understand that, okay? I wouldn't, and I left because of that, and, and that's fair to say one of the major reasons I left was because of that, but the bottom line really is, given my druthers, I want to be on one site. My life is simpler and my patient's life is simpler. End of story. Even people who oppose the merger agree that if the two hospitals were to come together on one site, many of the problems would be solved. But that option was ruled out early on in the discussions. Instead, the merger was sold as a way to create high-level specialties at each site. The Toronto Western was to become the home of a major new outpatient centre. But that project has reportedly been scrapped because it cost too much. Meanwhile, the Toronto General has become the centre for transplants and open-heart surgery. CBC at 6 was at the Toronto Western for this open heart operation last March. But this doesn't happen at the Western site anymore. Now all open heart surgery and transplants are done at the general site. Sources say it's great for people in that field, but it also ties up operating rooms for hours, delaying routine surgery like an appendectomy. A fact 79-year-old Catherine Bobco learned the hard way. She went to Toronto General with stabbing pains in her abdomen in the morning of October 4th. Her son, Michael Nikolaychuk, joined her there eight hours later. He waited with her another 10 hours. In total, his mother waited 18 hours without food or medication, with pain, until doctors finally operated. Do you think your mother could have potentially died through all of this? Was this on your mind that night? It was, yes, most certainly was on my, my mind, my sister's mind. Uh... Hospital notes obtained by CBC at 6 reveal that doctors diagnosed appendicitis within the first four hours and decided Mrs. Bobco needed an operation. But by the time the surgeons were ready to operate, the operating room was tied up with a transplant. At 11.30 that night, after 13 and a half hours of stabbing pain, the notes say ambulance called to transfer patient to Toronto Western Hospital. Then two hours later at 1.30 in the morning, the notes read, family becoming more upset about the transfer and amount of time it is taking. In the clinical notes sent over to the Western, one doctor wrote, thank you for seeing this patient as our operating room is closed and we are unable to give her the care we feel she needs. Off the record, doctors confided these delays are happening more and more often. Michael Nikolaychuk doesn't think his mother got the service she deserved. The process left a lot to be desired because certain people 
uh, didn't appear to have control over other people. So, in effect, there was no coordination between the various functions of the hospital. An act to amalgamate Toronto General Hospital and Toronto Western Hospital. When MPPs passed special legislation to approve the merger in 1986, they were told it would save money. The objective of this amalgamation is to streamline their administration and produce significant savings. The combined budget of the two hospitals then was $284 million. In four years, that has grown to a projected budget said to be $450 million. That's the largest budget of any hospital in Canada, although the Toronto Hospital ranks only third largest in bed size. At the same time, the hospital has closed at least 200 beds. The Good MPPs question, were also comment. told the merger would streamline services. But Michael Sargent's experience suggests the merger has complicated even the most routine situations. Not knowing all the bone specialists are now at the Western, Sargent went to the general with a broken ankle in August. Doctors there put on a splint and sent him by cab to the Western. Doctors there promptly cut off the splint because they couldn't see the ankle. Then they put a new one on and sent him home. One of the reasons for the merger was to facilitate services and cut costs. In your case, did you see any savings? Well, no, that was one of the things I was going to mention. Obviously, the service has been doubled up. In my case, I've had to pay for two emergency... Well, OHIP's had to pay for two emergency rooms, um, two doctor's services and um, two casts. So there's no saving there. And a taxi. And a taxi. CBC at 6 was live at the Toronto General when this trauma happened in March. Then all the experts were under one roof and saved the life of this man hit by a train. Today, cases like this are sent to the Western, even though it has no chest surgeons, no heart surgeons, and no surgeons who reattach blood vessels and limbs. I think it's an impossible situation. You know, if, you're, if you're unlucky enough to be admitted to the Toronto Western Hospital, for example, excuse me, the Toronto Hospital Western Division, um, with major multiple injuries, well, you'll have to make do without chest surgeons and without vascular surgeons. And in many cases, they're essential to your, your continuing excellent care. I was unable to get any official comment from the hospital about the merger. Five days ago, I put in a request to talk to the president. I was refused. As a result, many questions about the merger, the reasons for it, the benefits, and the problems remain unanswered. When Rene got the call... For Rene DeVoe, tortured by the thought of his happy young bride, stranded at a hospital with no neurosurgeon nearby to help her, those questions may never be answered. Why do you want to talk about it, Renee? <sighs> oh, it's for next person. <sighs> so, um... <sighs> Someone else's wife doesn't have to go through the same shit. I always think that that one question, what if? What if Debbie could have been saved at Toronto General Hospital? We'll never know. All of these problems have devastated morale at the two hospitals. Many of the people I talk to say they're trying to find other jobs, and those that have resigned themselves to staying say they're simply trying to keep their heads down and make it all work. All right, Kelly, is there any process whereby this merger can be reversed or at least reviewed to address some of the problems that it has created? Well, the administration appears to be doing some of that. Uh, this memo was sent out by the administration to some of the senior staff a couple of weeks ago, calling for a committee to look into the trauma and emergency uh, systems. One idea being to completely close the emergency room at Toronto General. That would solve one problem in that all emergencies would then have to go to the Western only, and that might stop some of the people having to be transferred between the two sites. But it would not address problems uh, that were raised in the situation with Debbie DeVoe, because the major services would still be separate separated between the two hospitals. All right, Kelly, thank you very much for that report. Thank you. Coming up on CBC at 6, a flood of donations for the Salvation Army after a costly weekend break-in.
Capture the elegance of a bygone era. Give your home warmth and personality. Create dramatic visual effects with architectural wood moldings from Fauché Lumber. These beautiful moldings are inexpensive, easy to install, and can be stained or painted to meet your needs. There's a complete selection, one of the largest in the county, and they're available in random lengths. Fauché Lumber is your ornamental molding specialist and your complete building center. Located on Fort Street in Amherstburg, just a short drive from Windsor. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, I like Christmas. Just not all the money people spend on gifts. Oh, oh. So this year I've seen to it that gifts are priced so low, even I'd buy them. Ebenezer. <laughs> Scrooge approved prices. Only at Canadian Tire. Scrooge approved prices. It's my little gift to everyone. What a nice gift, Ebenezer. Yes, doesn't cost me a cent. Canadian Tire lets you give like Santa and save like Scrooge. You know, I have to confess, I find you irresistible. Sometimes you're delicate and tantalizing. Other times, you're warm and passionate. And anywhere, anytime, you're a terrific charmer. And so... Uh, Al dente. Hmm? It's... Uh, it's made in Italy. And that's what I love about it. Pasta made in Italy. True love. I don't want to grow up. Weeble's busy fire station right on from Play School doubles as a playset, $39.94 or $34.94 after $5 rebate. And Flat Folks Farm, the two-sided playset for all around fun, $29.87 at Toys R Us. Christmas is a special time for family and friends, and it's a time when Shoppers Drug Mart helps to make your holidays festive and affordable. Right now, get this elegant silver-plated and brass picture frame free with a minimum $30 purchase of cosmetics or fragrances. Okay, plug them in. Hey, get that beaver away from the ladder. <laughs> Cruising with cooks in the Southern Caribbean this fall and winter on the world's newest ship sailing from San Juan is really something special. And so is the price. For under $1,000, including airfare, you can enjoy the luxurious new cruise ship Horizon. We'll visit San Juan, Martinique, Barbados, St. Lucia, Antigua, and St. Thomas. Book now and save $350 per cabin. Contact Cooks Travel, Leamington, or Windsor. U.S. clients call toll-free 1-800-265-3636. Metro Council has come to grips with the recession, but has rejected budget guidelines for a whopping 26% tax hike. Instead, Council has voted for an increase next year below the rate of inflation. Hamlin Grange has more on today's budget debate. Hamlin? Well, Hillary, a little sign of the recession easing up. The Metro government has to get tighter control of its spending next year. But that grip might have slipped just a little bit today. If you want to Metro's chief administrative the, officer uh, says if Metro wants to keep and taxes down and increase services like police and public uh, transit, budget. tough measures are needed. New programs will not be permitted. Program expansions will have to be restricted to the absolute minimum. Uh, no staff increases would be permitted. No increase in temporary staff or consultants. No increase in overtime. But some councillors believe the guidelines are unrealistic, and they talked about it for more than four hours. Council eventually voted to increase taxes by about 6% next year, instead of the 26% projected earlier this year. Toronto's mayor then suggested how council can reach its 6% target. Well, Your motion better. sounds pretty wishy-washy, no, I think. No, mine's much better. Why is yours much better than, than these? Well, these? These are quite clear what they want to do, yeah, well, the objectives. No, no, he said they were only guidelines, which meant that... But yours is only a guideline. Yeah, well, but I mean, they're not any clearer than mine. What I'm well, saying, I, I, mine's clear. Mine's clear. How is it clearer than these five? It's you tell in, me. It says that there is no new or expanded programs unless, in fact, they drop lower priority uh, programs. Eggleton's motion said nothing about reducing staff or cutting back on overtime. I'm disappointed. I really wanted those very obvious, clear guidelines. I thought that's what that report was about. The council has left it very vague, and I agree that that, ha that is vague. However, it is still my position, and uh, it will be the position of the management committee, I believe, that they will be attempting to come in at the rate of inflation. Is that possible? 
It's expected Metro's budget next year will be something about $3 billion. That's a 21% increase over last year, over this year. And most of the, uh, most of the money will, be, will account for the police, the TTC, uh, social services, and the transportation department. And Hillary, in other news from Metro Hall today, uh, they have just, just this, just this very minute, have elected the two councillors who will represent Metro on the very powerful police commission. It will be Dennis Flynn and Norm Gardner. No surprise there at all. They were actually elected on the first ballot, and they beat out uh, Toronto Mayor Art Eggleton and the staunch police critic, Mr. Roger Co uh, Hollander. Back to you, Hillary. All right, Hamlin, thank you. The Salvation Army in Toronto has discovered a real Christmas spirit in the city this year. It has received a flood of donations after thieves stole thousands of dollars worth of clothes and gift certificates last weekend. Lauren Madelon is standing by with that story. Lauren. Well, good evening, Hillary. Tonight from the corner of Lauren University with the sound of the Salvation Army kettle is clanging. And people connected with the Salvation Army and supporters of its various drives at this time of the year are talking, of course, about the robbery and the break-in, but more particularly about the response of individuals and companies after that incident. The actual robbery itself is a classic case of Christmas time greed, but above all, this is a story about good people. Linda Wissink and Elizabeth Clark are Salvation Army volunteers. Their warehouse was robbed over the weekend of $17,000 worth of clothing and food certificates. I think it's terrible. I think it's sick. Uh, we were talking about it yesterday wondering what kind of people would do that and it just baffles your mind we have no idea we'll have to make that up somehow but major hugh tilly says that what the salvation army lost has been more than made up for financially and emotionally you see they're sending they're saying there's lovely clothing but the, and they're sending the uh uh, the paper to wrap it in and a tag and the ribbon and the whole business. So Individuals have mailed in checks, dropped off stacks of toys, and one company gave $30,000 this week after a robbery Tilly just can't fathom. Disappointment. Just disappointment? Um, uh, a sorrow that, that uh, people would uh, rip us off at this time of the year when everybody's so busy. Uh, my reaction is I wish if they really need the help, they'd come and they'd ask us for help. We've been glad to give it to them. While toys and clothing have poured in, it's a nursery that ironically sells Christmas trees that really fill the void. The White Rose Nursery gave $80,000 after the robbery, 30000 more than its usual donation. I think if you uh, read the papers, and uh, no matter what they're talking about, everybody emphasizes the negative. And I think we are fortunate there are thousands of people with the goodwill to uh, help organizations like the Salvation Army. I was surprised that the help came in sort of one huge lump sum so fast, uh, but I'm grateful. Man, very well said there by Major Tilly of the Salvation Army. Right now, police in 41 Division tell us that they've received a number of calls in their investigation of this crime. They say they are doing everything they can to crack it, and uh, in the words of one, hopefully before Christmas, Holly. All right, thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Ontario's Attorney General is promising to set up special courts in the new year to deal with impaired driving cases. It's an attempt to deal with the hundreds of drunk driving charges that are being thrown out every month. But as Paul Hunter reports, the news is little consolation to those who've already had justice denied. It will be a painful Christmas for Sandra Davidson and her family. She has physiotherapy five times a week after injuries from a car accident more than a year ago. The driver of the other car was charged with impaired driving, but the case was dismissed in October because it had taken too long to get to trial. I just figured, well, this is going to get through, you know. But no, I couldn't believe it. Neither can hundreds of others. A Supreme Court ruling in October declared cases that take eight months or more to get to trial should be stayed or dismissed. Since then, nearly 8,500 cases have been stayed or dismissed in Ontario. Of those, more than 2,400 were impaired driving charges. If it doesn't come up within 68 months, they can walk out of court. All they have to do is hope that luck's on their side, that their case isn't going to turn up in court, which is bound to happen. The head of a group that fights impaired driving is furious. We have a judicial system that's more interested in the welfare and the rights of criminals, not, not, notably uh, impaired drivers, than they are in the interest and the well-being of the, uh, uh, certainly of victims. Today at Queen's Park, Conservative leader Mike Harris asked what the Attorney General is doing about it. Do you consider the 2,400 impaired charges that were thrown out serious? And if so, are you going to appeal each and every one of them? Howard Hampton said yes, it is serious, but that appealing all the cases would simply add to the court backlog ago, problem. Ago, he did make ago. one promise. We make the guarantee 
both to people out there in the law enforcement sector and the public, that as we go forward from here, charges that are laid now will not be stayed due to delay in the court system. Hampton expects that by next month, he'll have in place courts that are dedicated to impaired driving charges. But that means little to Davidson. There's no consolation to them saying, well, OK, your case is getting tossed out of court, but the next one we'll try and catch, the next one we'll try and deal with, you know. It isn't a consolation, none at all. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Bramley. Court backlogs, however, are good news for Harold Ballard, Jr. Four criminal charges against Ballard were withdrawn today because the case took too long to come to trial. He was charged with breaking and entering his father's Montgomery Road mansion in August 1989 and stealing $18,000 worth of furniture and maple leaf memorabilia. Still ahead on CBC at 6, Gorbachev's crackdown. The Soviet president says he will not hesitate to declare a state of emergency to crush unrest in rebel republics. The Ontario government made its long-awaited announcement today on the Constitution. Premier Bob Ray is setting up an all-party committee to tour Ontario. It will survey public opinion on national unity and the constitutional challenges facing Canada. As we reported on CBC at 6, Lynn Whittam is at Queen's Park tonight with the details. Thanks, Hillary. Premier Ray says he's learned from the failure of the Meech Lake Accord, and this time he wants to hear from people, not necessarily politicians, about Ontario's role in the future of Confederation. From the farmer in Ingersoll to the factory workers in Kaposkasing, Premier Ray says everyone will have a chance to have a say about Ontario and Canada's future. It's a populist approach to the constitutional question. The flaws of the Meech Lake process and of course the ultimate failure, have left deep wounds in Canada. But I think we can learn from that experience. Indeed, I would say we must learn from that experience. The people of Ontario must be involved. The people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, will be involved. And to get them involved, the Premier announced a one-two punch. First in January, a discussion paper defining the issues, including the economy and national institutions. Second, an all-party committee touring the province, listening to people and gathering their opinions. Still, Ray made Ontario's position clear. The rules may change, he says, but Canada stays one country. The arrangements within Confederation are negotiable. Confeder the existence of Canada is not negotiable. The opposition is participating in the committee, but says Ray's move is late in the game. And Robert Nixon warns he does not want the hearings to become a soapbox for some. But it is essential that this not be some sort of a lightning rod or some sort of a, a sounding board for those people in the community who in the past have embarrassed the people of this province, who carry a fleur-de-lis in their hip pocket so they can walk on it. Quebec applauds Ontario's committee, but warns no matter how good Ontario's intentions may be, there will be no province-to-province -province so talks about the Constitution. Concerned. We will refer to Ottawa to discuss any constitutional changes or modifications. Hinted today that Ontario might go into Quebec and other parts of Canada to gather opinions. By the way, the committee is made up of NDP, Conservatives and Liberals, and NDP member from Dovercourt, Tony Salipo, will be chairing the committee. Now, in another story, Premier Ray is investigating allegations that one of his cabinet ministers let a secret slip. It's alleged that uh, uh, Richard Allen, the MPP from Hamilton and cabinet minister, told some supporters in Hamilton that the NDP was going to kill an expressway. Howard Gould has that story. In Hamilton, the decision to cut off funding for the Red Hill Creek Expressway was controversial enough. The announcement was made Monday, and it angered many local politicians. Now it has been alleged that some Hamilton New Democrats found out Friday night. The Premier probably should wait to read it in the local press, but I am informed by the spectator that Mr. Hinckley has told him that Richard Allen told him about this information in a meeting in his office on Friday before the Monday in which it was communicated publicly. I will obviously investigate as to the truth of those allegations. Cabinet Minister Richard Allen did meet with City Councillor Brian Hinckley, a new Democrat, on Friday night, along with some other Hamilton-area NDP supporters. 
Allen says it was only to plan for a transportation announcement on Monday. Allen says he was the only person at that meeting who knew what the decision was, but he didn't tell anyone. That they can make an inference, that they can make an inference. That's the inference they make. But what I'm telling you is what the purpose of the meeting was, was to develop a strategy to respond to an announcement, not to reveal the content of a particular decision. The, the strategy Allen is talking about included a plan to invite environmentalists who were fighting the expressway to the announcement. But it's a so giveaway then. Hypothetically, rega no, regardless of what the decision was going to be, we would have wanted those people there. Allen so, does concede people at the meeting Friday might have been able to figure out what was coming Monday. But he says he didn't do anything wrong because he didn't deliberately tell anyone. I'm not entirely thrilled with what's happened. Premier Bob Ray says he will look into the matter. His investigation will include a meeting with Allen. I, I don't encourage uh, anybody to talk about cabinet decisions uh, before they're announced by the minister. The premier is emphasizing he takes this very seriously and he plans to move very quickly. In fact, Bob Ray says he'll have more to say tomorrow. Howard Gould, CBC News, Toronto. And Hillary, that's our report tonight from Queen's Park. All right, Lynn, thank you. The Bank of Montreal is again lowering its prime lending rate. Effective tomorrow, its rate will dip to 12 and 3 quarters percent. That is a drop of a quarter of a point. Other chartered banks are expected to do the same. The Bank of Canada will also announce its trend-setting rate tomorrow. Its rate has fallen steadily since August and now stands at 12.01 percent. And it's time now for the holiday weather forecast from Bill Lawrence. Hi, Bill. How does it look? Hey, a nice night out here tonight. Lots of clear sky and a few stars twinkling up there. Nothing falling on us tonight, Hillary. It's a little on the chilly side, but the heart of the cold is to the north and to the west of us, and we expect it will stay there right through the holiday season, although some of it may leak in and bring our temperatures down to about normal for this time of year. We're watching a storm. It'll probably affect our weather picture for this weekend here in southern Ontario, but then there is another one in behind that. Let's have a look, our first look at the holiday weather. This will be uh, applicable to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. We're basing this on a storm we expect to develop in the American Southwest and start moving towards us. Now, we'll get a better look, of course, as new guidance and information become available, but right now it looks quite unsettled with a mixture of rain and snow moving into southern Ontario on Monday and continuing and spilling on over into Christmas Day. The normal lows are minus eight and the normal highs are minus one. But as I say, this is a very preliminary and early look. We'll fine tune that as we move closer to the holiday. I did mention that we were watching another little storm that'll affect us this weekend. We'll tell you more about that later on. Right now, let's have a look at the forecast for southwestern Ontario, for Windsor and for London. Overnight, generally clear skies at minus six degrees in both those locales. Winds will become quite sharp and brisk out of the east at about 40 kilometers an hour overnight. And then tomorrow, partly cloudy for London and Windsor, the high not far from one degree. Here in the metropolitan Toronto area and eastward, we expect to say variable skies overnight, a little cooler down to minus seven, and variable conditions tomorrow. We get the easterly blast tomorrow at about 50 kilometers an hour, and tomorrow's high here in the metropolitan Toronto area, not far from minus two. We'll be back and we'll have a closer look at that Christmas holiday weekend coming up. And we'll also look at the weather right across the country and see how cold it has to be to freeze the tea in old BC. <laughs> Still to come on CBC at 6, the arts community is up in arms over changes to Harborfront. Beth Harrington explains. Beth? Hi, Hillary. Yes, uh, Harborfront is getting closer to becoming a thing of the past, or so say some well-known Toronto artists. They think Harborfront will end up a cultural wasteland without more support. I'll have more on that story next in entertainment. Hi to your federal government representatives, to your provincial government representatives. Quality. It's something most people demand when buying produce. But high prices can make people question its value. Isn't it refreshing to know there's a place where quality and price come together to provide real value? At Elias Fruit... Hey, hey, guys, fellas, lady, lady! <clears throat> At Elias Fruit Markets, it's a simple formula, nothing fancy. Just real value delivered fresh every day. Elias Fruit Markets, we keep it simple. Who was that? When I look like this, my guys challenge me to lose 20 pounds. Me, Tommy Lasorda, the guy who loves to eat. 
Well, I lost 30 pounds in three months with the Ultra Slim Fast Weight Loss Plan. It was easy. I had a delicious shake for breakfast, one for lunch, and then a wholesome dinner. And I didn't feel hungry. The pounds dropped off. Isn't that great? You know, this is the first time I ever lost anything and felt good about it. Ultra Slim Fast. Give us a week. We'll help you lose weight. The baby in this picture is going to have a very special year. A year of first steps, first words, first birthday. And none of these firsts will ever happen again. Now, if you were this baby's parents, which film would you choose? No other film in the world gives you pure, richer colors than Kodakolor Gold Film. Aren't your pictures worth gold? The pharaohs of ancient Egypt held the highest respect for the art of the goldsmith, who transformed native gold into exquisite treasures. The gift of jewelry is the golden chain that links us to this past. Remarkably, the art of creating and restoring fine gold jewelry is practiced by few today. K5 presents Pro Hockey Funnies, a hilarious home video of the NHL's dark remorse. Hockey's the world's toughest game, especially played like this. There are practical jokes, and unfriendly folks. There's glass smashing and stick trashing. Whoa, man overboard. If you like hacked up hockey, you'll love Pro Hockey Funnies. Only $19.99 from K5. Available at the Bay, Zellers, Wilco Woolworth, Kresge Kmart, participating Canadian Tire, Sam the Record Man. Action. That's her. She killed him. You killed him, Laura. Romance. Nikki, I love you. I wasn't using you. Mystery. Well, just because he was here doesn't mean he had anything to do with it, you know. I hate coincidence. Where were you tonight? You do think I killed him. Night Heat, Wednesday nights at 8. Harborfront's cutbacks has been strong, and today prominent members of Toronto's arts community held a press conference to talk about Harborfront's plight. Many are concerned there is too much of a rush on to finalize plans for Harborfront's complex and that wrong decisions are being made. Stu Patterson has more on that story. Hundreds of artists, performers, and public figures may be smiling, but they're angry and determined. They're united and fighting federal plans to dismantle Harborfront and its so cultural programs, programs that attract three and a half million people a year. Because it will be $2 million short, Harborfront says 300 of its 450 programs could be chopped. The complex, which hosts events like the World Music and Dance Festival, it could close in two weeks because Ottawa says Harborfront's assets must be sold off. It's your money, your right to protest the fact that it's disappearing. The struggle has to be carried to both City Hall and to Queen's Park. I need the, uh, the author's series. I need the power plant. When I discuss with people a possibility that they'll come to, to act in a film of mine for several months in Toronto, I, the first thing I mention is Harborfront. There's $2 million that is necessary to keep the programs that are happening at present at Harborfront continuing. Two million dollars is an amazing amount of money to somebody like me and I'm sure to most of you. It's a small drop in the bucket in the provincial coffers, the city coffers, and the federal coffers. One speaker went so far as to suggest artists bring in their sleeping bags and hold a 60s style occupation to make their point. And that point, to convince Ottawa to reopen talks in hopes of saving programs from the chopping block. We want everyone in Toronto, in the province, in Canada, to write to their MPs, to pressure the federal government, to send telegrams. What are the chances of the talks being reopened? Your guess is as good as mine. A petition campaign is underway. In light of what Ottawa has said about harborfront funding and considering the fact we're in a recession, members of this coalition could be in for the fight of their lives. Let's hope it's not too little too late. And that's it in entertainment for this evening. And now here's some of the things happening around tonight.
Coming up on CBC at 6, an American colonel says U.S. forces in the Gulf won't be ready for a January 15th deadline. The call has come, so soon they'll come to this place. Chase a puck, maybe chase a dream. But mostly, they'll come just to play. Every kid needs to play, to be a kid. Easter Seals delivers. This season, Molson Canadian and Canadian Light will donate a portion of sales, $300,000, to Easter Seals. If you're out this season, please take care. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, I like Christmas. Just not all the money people spend on gifts. Oh, oh. So this year I've seen to it that gifts are priced so low, even I'd buy them. Ebenezer. <laughs> Scrooge approved prices. Only at Canadian Tire. Scrooge approved prices. It's my little gift to everyone. What a nice gift, Ebenezer. Yes, doesn't cost me a cent. Canadian Tire lets you give like Santa and save like Scrooge. Cruising with cooks in the Southern Caribbean this fall and winter on the world's newest ship sailing from San Juan is really something special. And so is the price. For under $1,000, including airfare, you can enjoy the luxurious new cruise ship Horizon. We'll visit San Juan, Martinique, Barbados, St. Lucia, Antigua, and St. Thomas. Book now and save $350 per cabin. Contact Cooks Travel, Leamington, or Windsor. U.S. clients call toll-free 1-800-265-3636. Merry Christmas. Yeah, Merry Christmas. Ebenezer Scrooge. Oh, I like Christmas. Just not all the money people spend on gifts. Oh, oh. So this year I've seen to it that gifts are priced so low, even I'd buy them. Ebenezer. <laughs> Scrooge approved prices. Only at Canadian Tire. Scrooge approved prices. It's my little gift to everyone. What a nice gift, Ebenezer. Yes, doesn't cost me a cent. Canadian Tire lets you give like Santa and save like Scrooge. K5 International presents Christmas Cartoons, a delightful new home video. Imagine over three full hours of animated magic designed to help kids while away those long winter afternoons. Christmas Cartoons, specially selected animated classics to amuse and entertain your little ones during the holiday season. Christmas Cartoons, three hours of family fun for only $19.99 from K5. At the Bay, Zellers, Wolka Woolworth, Kresge Kmart, Canadian Tire, Sam the Record Man. Mikhail Gorbachev says he is ready to impose direct rule in some of the Soviet Union's more rebellious republics. Gorbachev's warning came during a speech at the Congress of People's Deputies in Moscow. Don Murray reports. Gorbachev's remarks were the clearest indication yet of a coming crackdown. Where the situation becomes especially tense, he said, I will have to introduce a state of emergency or presidential rule. That threat came just hours after 53 deputies, including the men who run the Army, Navy, and Air Force, circulated a letter calling for the imposition of a state of emergency. As the national and political conflicts have multiplied, the country's economy has begun to disintegrate. National production is officially down 3% from last year. Exports have dropped 12%. Despite a record harvest, the Soviet Union is now reduced to asking for food aid. Prime Minister Nikolai Rishkov made the economic figures public in a gloomy speech this morning. Perestroika, as it was conceived, and I would underline this, has not succeeded. He also joined the chorus denouncing extremists and calling for extreme countermeasures. Their main goal is to strike down the government and the socio-political order, smashing it once and for all. But Boris Yeltsin... President of the Russian Federation, Gorbachev's main political rival, and according to polls, the most popular Soviet politician, didn't join the chorus calling for a crackdown. Russia will not agree to the reimposition of the dictatorship of the Kremlin, which in any event has not got a program for the renaissance of the country. Only the republic should decide what sort of structure the central government should have. And so the stage has been set for a clampdown by the Kremlin on rest of republics and possibly for a clash with the leader of the biggest republic, Russia. Don Murray, CBC News, Moscow. 
One of the top U.S. military commanders in the Persian Gulf says that American troops will not be ready to mount an offensive by January the 15th. Lieutenant Colonel Calvin Waller says that late arriving U.S. combat troops will not be ready for action until well past the U.N. deadline for an Iraqi withdrawal from Kuwait. The White House is trying to downplay the remarks, but even the U.S. Secretary of Defense agrees with part of the assessment. David Martin of CBS News reports. Ships disgorge the equipment for an entire Marine division. One of four additional divisions being sent to back up President Bush's threats against Saddam Hussein. But Defense Secretary Cheney, who arrived in Saudi Arabia today, said the reinforcements would not be combat ready by the January 15th deadline. And the deputy commander of Operation Desert Shield, General Calvin Waller, was quoted as saying some troops might not be ready until February 15th. Until then, Waller said, he'd have to tell the president, I'm not ready to do the job. One reason? The reinforcements are coming in at a slower pace than the first troops sent here last August. Now that the rush to defend Saudi Arabia is over and the offensive buildup has begun, the crews are taking a little longer to unload the equipment and get it ready for combat. We wanted to go at a, at a slower pace uh, to emphasize safety uh, down inside the ships where the individual Marines are having to uh, maneuver all of the vehicles in a very confined space. Another reason. It takes about 10 days from the time troops arrive in Saudi Arabia until they are in the field and fully armed. But then they still must learn the ropes of operating in the desert, like navigating at night. It takes two or three uh, good weeks of hard, hard work out there, uh, relying upon, of course, the old compass and the odometer on your vehicle. You could use a given point A to point B. They're going to get lost. That report was from David Martin of CBS News. Right across western Canada in BC, mid afternoon temperature, Vancouver minus five degree, and they in Victoria tonight. That'll frost their tea. They're on their way down to minus 14 degrees at Victoria and Vancouver. And you saw the temperatures across the prairies. Those are daytime highs running near minus 30 degrees. And of course, they cool off tonight to down to minus 35 or so. Have a look at our map tonight. There it is a big dome of high pressure, cold Arctic air sitting right in the middle of the prairie provinces, a strong northwesterly wind pumping across now into central and eastern Canada. As we uh, look at the cold front, you can see it there, strung like a garland from the Pacific. Down, they expect snow tonight in San Francisco. The front cuts across the Lower Lakes region. Winds are in the warm sector, the remainder of southern Ontario in the cold sector, and it cuts out along the valley, and we expect it to stay that way for most of the holiday weekend. Right in the middle, down about to Oklahoma, center of low, a little ornament on that garland, if you will. That starts heading up towards southern Ontario for the weekend. It gives us a mixture of rain and or wet snow and or freezing rain for Saturday and for Sunday. A look at the province today. Here's the way it was in southern Ontario. First into the Ottawa Valley we go. And there this afternoon, little light snow, temperature at minus 10 degrees. Sunny around Sudbury and North Bay, minus 16. They're down to an overnight low of minus 24. Timmins, the high under sunny skies today, 21. That's a minus 21. They'll cool off to minus 27 degrees tonight. Partly cloudy at Thunder Bay, minus 14. Kenora, Lake of the Woods, cloudy and minus 19 degrees. Across southern Ontario, nice sunny day at Windsor. They hit four, and that's a plus four. And then London and Toronto, partly cloudy, temperatures not far from one degree. The forecast then for tonight and tomorrow for southwestern Ontario, London and Windsor, clear skies, minus six the low, easterly winds gusting to 40 kilometers an hour overnight, partly cloudy tomorrow, and one degree for Toronto. Here's the way it shapes up. Variable skies tonight and tomorrow, the overnight low at minus seven. Tomorrow, with an easterly wind at 50 kilometers an hour, wind chill factor to be taken into consideration, tomorrow's high at minus two. For Friday, the first day of winter, a 50% probability of showers Saturday an 80% chance of rain temperature at 5 degrees and then for Sunday a mixture of rain freezing rain and or snow and a high not far from 2 degrees Hillary that's the weather for tonight thank you Bill this is CBC at 6 coming up Bruce Dobian and sports 
Well, Hillary, the Leafs are in Manhattan tonight, and they'll need reinforcements after last night's win over the Islanders. Tie with the Islanders. If your Christmas holiday calls for more sand than snow, check out Sears Island Palm and Black Sand Beachwear for men at 30% off. Just about everyone is into hot fashions from Sears. Your money's worth and more. From Ideal comes Rub-A-Dub Dolly, made just for bath time fun. $36.99 or $31.99 after $5 rebate. Bath tub sold separately. And Rattle Me Bones, the motorized glow-in-the-dark pirate game, 1878. Batteries sold separately. Starting Wednesday, December 19th, and for the remainder of the week, only one store wraps ladies up right for the night with special savings. Zellers has one-third off a wide selection of fall and winter ladies' lounge and sleepwear. Robes to cuddle up in, pajamas to be cozy in, and teddies and penoir sets to dream the night away in. At the one store that wraps it up right with free valuable Club Z points, Zellers. Zellers wraps it up right. quality. It's something most people demand when buying produce. But high prices can make people question its value. Isn't it refreshing to know there's a place where quality and price come together to provide real value? At Elias... Hey, hey, guys, fellas, lady, lady! <clears throat> At Elias Fruit Markets, it's a simple formula, nothing fancy, just real value delivered fresh every day. Elias Fruit Markets, we keep it simple. Who was that? Christmas is a wonderfully special time of year. A time you can be with family and friends and enjoy the best of the season. And Christmas is a time when each shopper's drug mart is filled with special savings on everything you need to make your holidays festive, healthy, and affordable. Okay, plug them in. Hey, there's only room for one star on this tree. If your Christmas holiday calls for more sand than snow, check out Sears Island Palm and Black Sand Beachwear for men at 30% off. Just about everyone is into hot fashions from Sears. Your money's worth and more. A wicked slap shot. A brilliant save. This is K5's Dynamite on Ice, an explosive new home video. The NHL's Black and Blue Brigade is Dynamite on Ice. Number 99 is Dynamite on Ice. Wayne Gretzky, the great one, has become the greatest of them all. The NHL's Young Warriors are Dynamite on Ice. Only $19.99 from K5. Available at the Bay, Zellers, Wilco Woolworth, Crescent Kmart, participating Canadian Tire, Sam the Record Man. Oh, yes, New York, New York, the town's so nice, they named it twice. It's not so nice if you're a visiting NHL club, however. You have to play two games before they let you out of the dad blame pace place. The Leafs made out all right last night in game one of their Big Apple encounter. They tied the Islanders 2 all. But as Ken Daniels reports from New York City, they'll be without Wendell Clark, who hurt his shoulder last night, and newest acquisition Mike Foligno as they face the Rangers tonight. The 2-2 tie on Long Island stretched the Leafs' unbeaten streak to four games on the road. And it could have been a fourth win if the woeful power play could ever manage a goal. The penalty killers did their job scoring shorthanded to boot. Bends it in! Following last night's tough game against the New York Islanders, the Maple Leafs held an optional skate this morning here at Madison Square Garden. And as you can tell, most of the players have opted out. Meantime, a few of the Maple Leafs have headed home to Toronto to have various injuries checked out. Mike Foligno lasted just three shifts into his Maple Leaf debut before banging up the knee. He got cut in a rut and uh, twisted the knee. So uh, right now it's a, a sprain of the left knee and we're just having the doctors evaluate it to see just how serious the situation is. Mike Foligno was quite the guy in the bench hurt and yet uh, he didn't want to leave. He's a competitor. He's a real character fellow, and uh, it's great to have him aboard. Hopefully the injury's not going to be too serious. And with Felino and Wendell Clark out of the lineup, the Leafs lose potential muscle and goals, something they desperately need from Daniel Merwa. 
He was on the ice for both Islander tallies last night and was told to take a seat by Tom Watt for the entire third period. The benching sometimes gets the mind to wandering, doesn't it? Well, it's not. Well, you know, it's hard for everybody, eh? especially uh, me, my third season and stuff like that. But no, I'm going to... I'm going to work hard, <laughs> you know, so I don't have a choice, and uh, we'll see next couple of days. With Mike Foligno and Wendell Clark hurting, Doug Shedden has been recalled from Newmarket and will make the trip here to New York for tonight's game. Brad Marsh has also headed home to Toronto. He's missed 13 games in a row. Now he is out with back spasms. That's obviously just due to practicing. Rumor is, after the Christmas break, the Leafs will offer Brad Marsh a coaching job. But something tells me he wants to keep playing and reach the 1,000-game mark. We'll see. From Madison Square Garden in New York, I'm Ken Daniels reporting for CBC Sports. And the latest word on Clark and Foligno is not good. We were just hearing from Ken in New York City. They say Mike Foligno could be out up to five to seven weeks with a strained knee injury. That's five to seven. That's a preliminary diagnosis. Wendell Clark a little bit better. He allowed to be out of the lineup with that separated shoulder for seven to ten days. So they'll miss both of those players tonight. Well, anyone who's ever gone around the Southern Ontario radio dial on a nice warm southern uh, summer night has probably encountered the dulcet tones of Ernie Harwell. He's the radio voice of the Detroit Tigers on radio station WJR, pounding all over North America, 50,000 watts. And in the years before the Blue Jays arrived, well, a Georgia native was as close to a home broadcaster as you might have had in this region. But as Harwell told a press conference in Detroit today, the Tigers have told him they're letting him go after 1991. The radio station, WJR, and the Tiger Baseball Club have decided that 1991 will be the last year that I will broadcast play-by-play -play for the Detroit Tigers. I've signed a contract for 91. I wanted to go farther. I wanted to work more years. But the station and the ball club combined told me that they didn't want me to broadcast Tiger Baseball after 1991 and that they were going in a new direction. Well, I spoke with Blue Jays broadcaster Jerry Howarth this afternoon, and uh, Jerry described uh, Harwell as his best friend in baseball. He called him an eloquent, humane voice in the industry, and he'll always be the voice of the Detroit Tigers. And to that, I can only say amen. Ernie Harwell, always a hero of mine, and he will be missed after this season. The Boston Red Sox obviously impressed with the moves that Pat Gillick made at the winter meetings. They've been drastically re-altering their lineup, trying to catch up with the moves that Gillick made after inking Jack Clark as a free agent on the weekend. Today, they went out and signed pitcher Danny Darwin, a right-handed starter. He'll replace Mike Boddicker in the starting rotation for the Boston Red Sox. Uh, he, Darwin getting himself a four-year deal today. He's a 35-year-old starting pitcher, and he got himself four years from the Boston Red Sox. That's how desperate people are for established starting pitching in the American League East these days. And finally, Detroit Lions sending three players to the Pro Bowl, the NFL Pro Bowl, Barry Sanders, Jerry Ball, and return specialist Mel Gray, all going to the big game in Honolulu. And don't you wish we were, Hillary, going to Honolulu. Back mm -hmm. to you. Sure do, Bruce. Thank you. And that is CBC at 6 for Wednesday, December the 19th. Thank you for joining us. I'm Hillary Brown. Have a good evening. Good night.